Yukio Mishima speaks of the criminal class as the only Japanese Japanese, the only Japanese who are not um, aware that they are a monoculture and therefore one culture among others. Um, the ruling class of Japan, um, uh, Yoko Ono, or people who went to the Pierce School, and Mishima himself um, underwent a uh, English transformation um, and um, even prior to that with um, Admiral Perry breaking in in the 19th century uh, breaking into Japan and opening up trade um, some Americanization some Germanization uh, Dugan is um, in this connection um, uh, Dugan doesn't m mention uh, Mishima, but the connection that I'm making uh, is mentioning um, a film called uh, Ishii the Killer, and he's connecting that up with the um, something more like primordial chaos. So we'll have to go into go into that. You can see that uh, chaos is uh, being used in multiple ways here um, and also the state prior to uh, this Rene Girard uh, mimetic desire so prior to the human being understood as um, a being of desire or a being of uh, logos um, a prior state uh, perhaps uh, more similar to the originary um, meaning of uh, abyss as the, the um, excuse me, as chaos as the yawning abyss or the um, simply the uh, this dark opening. Um, so I'm going to try to go back to the um, subject matter which I think uh, is of interest in a lot of ways of uh, Straussian uh, reception, Strauss's reception of um, an understanding of uh, Epicureanism after this uh, um, taking a look at uh, what some of the discussion on YouTube has uh, pointed to um, this political Platonism um, uh, chapter or part of a lecture um, apparently it's a I, I'm not quite sure it seems to be a lecture given in Russian which was um, probably translated by Michael Millerman, who's the main translator of uh, Dugan. And um, so in it, he's uh, speaking of chaos and logos. And um, uh, there's a metaphor of uh, um, concerning Aquarius, the age of Aquarius. Um, so the basic, uh, so what I want to do is try to, in a small way, provide some paideia, which is to say, to um, equip ourselves with uh, enough uh, understanding of what these terms are pointing to that we can um, move, around, we can read these kind of things on our own and move forward on our own um, in making an interpretation of uh, this kind of text. So, uh, w one thing I'll say is, uh, if you don't like Dugan, you can also get some of this, um, clearly this um, chapter uh, overlaps with a lot of things Der Derrida is uh, doing with the um, so-called logo phallocentrism. The, uh, so you can get the same, uh, a different reading, but the same um, correctly um, coordinated um, uh, phenomena out of Heidegger's account, which is also in a larger sense uh, um, kind of a Prussian account of uh, world history, let's say of Western history, uh, which involves a great many um, thinkers. Uh, so 
uh, let me give an incident from, so Martin Jay, uh, the UC Berkeley scholar has said, um, after 30 years or so of studying people like Adorno, um, people out of the um, German uh, modernizing sphere and um, Lukács and left it, basically leftists in the um, German scene um, who are dealing with the same materials uh, as or, or Heidegger or Diltai or um, uh, anyone interested in, in uh, historicism. Um, he has said that um, his main uh, inquiry was to try to see what these people meant by reason and why they were, uh, it, it, it resounded so much in their, um, in their emotions uh, in, uh, let me say, the, let me give the following uh, analogy here to give it, transfer the meaning to um, the Western scene, which we can't see directly. So um, during the conquest, um, I had a, um, a friend of mine who's an um, anthropologist who studied these things like the Codex Loud and, and these other um, uh, books from the, um, South America. So there's an incident that there, um, some uh, one of the conquistadors wrote back uh, to the old world saying, um, describing the um, fantastic um, throes of um, uh, uh, how upset the um, priests were at the burning of their um, these little colored uh, books they had. Um, he found there's something uh, he he couldn't he didn't get it why were they so um, upset so you know they were burning their um, the core uh, works of their um, their civilization so in the same way uh, we no longer can quite understand what the uh, downgoing of reason or the logos means we're in the this period of dissonance so Schoenberg says um, Dissonance dissonance is um, a remote consonance. So so long as we're in the period that we describe here, when Dugan is talking about chaos here, part of he's using chaos in multiple ways, but part of what he's saying is um, since the logos has already gone down, since we no longer can really access it. So for instance, the first chapter I've always uh, cite this, but the first chapter, the clearest um, exposition, which I've been pointed to by Strauss is. Um, the first chapter of Arnold Brecht's, uh, or the beginning of Arnold Brecht's book uh, on uh, political theory, where he says that um, there was a um, general agreement on the values of the West, um, freedom of conscience, and other things. Uh, but then it, it sort of disappeared, and instead came in the, uh, the claim that the um, experimental sciences are all that uh, knowledge comprises and we can't really have knowledge about the so-called values and so and so on so that coincides with the downgoing of the um, the logos so the Air, let's say the Aristotelian logos uh, in the question on YouTube uh, Aristotle was mentioned why is Aristotle the fish in this metaphor um, that's in the uh, lecture so um, the chaos uh, is manifold, but it has to do with still a referring back to the consonants of the time when the uh, the logos still was able to uh, be, um, uh, let's say, spontaneously affirmed, and uh, there was a kind of um, general agreement on that. But it deeper than a general agreement, it was seemed to be simply reality itself. So. Um, it's very so we're touching on a very the, the uncanniness itself in a certain way when we get into these subjects um, because um, the logos or presence is all we have to understand for the world to be here for us as something that we understand in any way so when it shifts uh, we lose the whole ground so it's not like we can so that's the one I, one I wanted to get out in this example of uh, Ishii the Killer. Um, if you look at the Japanese uh, through this through the examples I've given before about looking, so it's like this this um, this telegraph came back uh, 
from Japan around the time of, um, I think it's analogous to what uh, what Dugan's saying too, around the time of, uh, let's say around the year 1900, um, saying the Japanese, uh, to back to the English speaking world, to, um, to California, I think actually to San Francisco, um, saying the Japanese, uh, they see nudity, but they don't look. So you can actually see that uh, some of that even in this Ishii the Killer uh, film and still in Japan, the, 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 the sexuality does not have um, the moral aspect and they don't look at it. They see it, but they don't look. Um, so in the same way Dugan is saying here, this uh, chaos, the yawning abyss of the violence in the film of the criminal underclass of, uh, if you want to call it an underclass of uh, Japan, who still may have some remnants of the Japanese Japanese, which is to say, um, uh, so Alan McFarland says these people from the uh, this the Alatai Mountains, um, the, basically the most landlocked place in, on Earth, have traveled out to Japan. Um, I think I misstated that uh, before about the I, I forgot the Ainu people are the ones that um, these so-called um, autochthonous people of Japan, the Marhari people, were the ones that worshipped the bear, I think. But the um, Alatai people are really the Japanese, and uh, Alan McFarland calls them a shamanistic culture. So this archaic shamanism and, um, you know, Eliade's subject matter to, um, uh, already before the drums have begun to beat, um, uh, my spirit is flying. Um, and actually... Um, McFarlane himself uh, maintains that a photograph has shown the uh, shamanistic action of some um, people in China in, uh, somehow registered on the photograph, which is, but the, putting that claim aside, um, this is a radical difference of um, the people of Japan from most of the other people on earth, according to this account. But then um, a question I would bring in is, how so far are we seeing that through our own lens? So. The consonants, uh, when it exists, would refer somehow back to the yawning abyss notion of uh, chaos in the Greeks. Uh, this is going kind of long, and I'm going to have to probably do a second one on this. But um, it, are we even right in saying that the Japanese uh, see but not look? Is that already um, simply to, to, to present them as... A, um, a lesser form of Westerners, Westerners who don't yet look, Westerners who, in Rene Gerard's view, haven't yet become mimetic or begun to represent with presence, with the presence of the Logos. So just an inferior form of Westerners. But perhaps that's the only way we have access into looking at them. Uh, that's the only way we can bring them into presence, bring them into the Logos. Uh, so Aristotle has specifically mentioned um, for the reason that the formalization of um, the rules of logic, which have to do with saying um, this is the things we can state with the logos, meaning speech, and when we formalize them, we make sure that we state them in the right way so that they can become knowledge, proper knowledge. Um, uh, so the rule of identity being the, the first one, and then contradiction being involved in dialectic discussion, and then... Um, excluded middle, and then finally, after thousands of years, uh, Heidegger says Leibniz comes out with the um, rule that everything has to be, have a reason. So everything, the Logos has to be able to grip everything. Everything must be present, in other words. So this absence is uh, the disorder, and the Logos is uh, recta ratio, it's ordered, it's right, right ordered soul, right ordered political body, etc. It's this which is um, going away and degenerating into the dissonance or the chaos in the um, degenerate sense, not the chaos in the original consonant sense. But the new beginning would mean that somehow we'd have to get out of this um, whole field of intelligibility. Um, I guess one more thing I just want to add to that is... Uh, we should understand logos here very simply. So anytime you have a syllogism, it should apply to the body, to, the body, to life, just as much as to the statement. So if I say I, I kick a rock, 
rock is hard, therefore um, it causes me pain. And then I think um, if somebody else does the same thing, it's going to cause them pain. Um, this is reasoning, which I can do just in speech, in the abstract form, but it's meant to be just as true in life, in the things, in, uh, in the world, so that there's a complete hermetic ceiling there. So it's the um, attempt of Logos to make presence uh, the Welt built into everything, which is um, in some way in question here. Um, so I think that, so maybe that gives just a little bit of a, um, a, a chance of the, the material embracing us when we read it and a chance of ours being able to make our own way through the, the, these terms which are, um, uh, appear at first blush to be totally um, just techni new technical terms without any um, body, without any um, uh, meaning as, or without any actual um, sense to them. Uh, okay, so in the comments, maybe people can say whether that that actually has offered us any um, additional um, access to the uh, materials or not. <laughs>